Well, good morning. I uh, couldn't ask for probably a better song to start us off, and I didn't ask, actually. I probably should have, uh, but I appreciate that. I, I hope you took the words to heart. Um, do you walk with God? Are you walking with God? Are you staying close to Him? Uh, that's going to be a lot of what our lesson is going to be about uh, this morning because, you know, I've been watching my kid uh, as he's slowly uh, learning to move more than I would like to have to chase him around uh, or maybe more so than my wife would probably like to have to chase him around. Well, he's starting to learn to walk now. Uh, he can't do it by himself yet, but he can get up on two feet uh, and he can walk a few steps here and there uh, with a little bit of, uh, of help just uh, holding on to something. Uh, but the crazy thing is, you know, when you think about learning how to walk, sometimes you might think about it like learning how to ride a bike. Do you remember learning how to walk? Do you remember when you learned how to do that as a child? Does your brain even think about it? Or does it just come so naturally to you that you just walk? Well, guess what? The reason is because is there's only one way to do it. There's only one way to walk. Now, I mean, you might come up with other things or you might have a little more swagger your step in a different way than other people do. But the idea is that you can only walk by putting one foot in front of the other. So if you start walking around sidestepping everywhere, it's going to get you a lot slower, but you might be able to get there eventually. The idea is that we learn how to walk a natural way, a way that God intended us to by the way that he designed us to. Well, when it comes to our spiritual life, the way we walk is very similar. There's only one right way. One way that we were designed to walk. One way that we were designed to live our lives. And that is in Him. That is in Christ. In God. Walking hand in hand with Him. The thing is, is unfortunately in our world, and not just today in our time, I'm sure many of us could point to occasions or to, to maybe individuals or, or, or entities that are trying to change that thought. But specifically, even in the, in the day of the early Christians, going uh, back to the time of Christ, they were already dealing with people who were trying to bring about different ideas of the way that you should walk, the way that you should live your spiritual life. They were trying to confuse and they were trying to delude and do all these kind of things to make you live the way that they wanted you to live, rather than simply walking in God, walking in Christ in the way that you should. The main focus of our, of our lesson this morning is going to be one that was actually already up on the screen, and that's second, uh, Colossians chapter 2, verses 6. And verse 7. But what you see in the book of Colossians, what Paul is dealing with, why he has to write this letter, is because there's a problem that's occurring between many of these congregations, many of these towns there, where they have people that are coming in and trying to delude them. They're trying to do all these different things. If you look at chapter 2, verse 4, you see that they're trying to delude them with persuasive arguments. If you look at chapter 2, verse 8, they are trying to take them captive through philosophy and deception. If you look at chapter 2, verse 16... They're trying to act as a judge over them, trying to tell them and force them what to do. And then again, if you look at verse 18 in chapter 2 as well, it says that they are trying to defraud them by acting as an umpire, by acting as the person who says what's right and what's wrong and what you are allowed to do in your life. They're trying to force them to walk in a particular way, and they're trying to take away all their right to do it in the way that they should. They're trying to force this upon them to delude them in that way. And so Paul is trying to help people understand what it means to walk in him and understand how we're supposed to do it, but not just how we're, how we're supposed to do it, but to have full assurance in the way that we do. If you open your Bibles to the book of Colossians, we're going to be focusing on two particular verses. That's it. Two verses this morning. We're going to be focusing on Colossians chapter 2, verse 6 and 7. In verse 6 it says, Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, walk in Him. Walk in Him. It doesn't say walk in somebody else. It doesn't say walk in me. It says walk in Him. You have received Christ your Lord. Walk in Him. If you back up a little bit, a lot of the main idea or a lot of the force uh, behind what Paul's trying to help them with uh, comes back all the way uh, to verse 2 of chapter 2. It says that your hearts may be encouraged having been, been knit together in love and attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding resulting in a true knowledge of God, uh, of God's mystery. That is Christ himself. 
He's trying to help these people find a full assurance of the Christ that they have received. And he says, you can have full assurance. Walk in him and you won't be led astray. Walk in him and you'll be safe. So we're going to focus not just on the fact that Paul gives us this command. This is a command for us to do by Paul the Apostle. Something we are supposed to do. But he tells us how to do it. He doesn't just leave us hanging. He doesn't just uh, tell us to do something and then not help us along the way to help better understand it. He actually carries out uh, a, a list of what we need to be doing. And that's what we see in the next verse. In verse 7 it says... Having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. So we're going to make that our four points this morning that he tells us how to do this, how to walk in him, how to, how to take Christ as the, the lead in your life and to follow him on the only path that is considered right. The only path that we should be walking down. So the first one we're going to look at is that being firmly rooted. Um, you know, this is something that, that uh, has this idea of a, of a tree planted by the water. You know, there's a passage in Psalms uh, that many of us know. Psalm chapter 1, verse 3, or the first Psalm, verse 3, uh, talks us about this idea of being firmly planted uh, or having this firm root, what this can do for you. And what does Psalm 1, 3 says? It says it bears fruit. If you're someone who is firmly rooted in the way that you should be, you're going to be able to bear fruit in the way that you should. You're going to be able to maintain in the way that you should. But it also says that you aren't going to waste away. You're going to be able to have the ability to stand firm uh, no matter what comes against you. Uh, no matter what happens, you aren't going to die off because you are firmly rooted in what is the most important thing, and that is Christ. So no matter who comes against you, no matter who tries to delude you of what you believe, no matter who tries to, to take you away, no matter what tribulation or what trial or what suffering someone might bring upon your life, your family's life or those you care about, guess what? You won't waste away. Not spiritually. Because you have Christ. Because you are firmly rooted in him and all that you have received. It also says, and I'm sorry if it's a little harder to see, it says that you prosper in all that he does is what Psalm 1-3 says. And so not only are we going to be firmly rooted, which has this idea of being uh, strong and spiritually productive for God. You're going you're gonna to be able to do everything that you need to do, uh, but you're also going to have the ability to not waste away when bad things come against you. And in the end, you're going to prosper. Now, this prosper might not always be the monetary value that we might think of when it comes to prospering, but you're talking about prospering in a way that is so much more important. We're going to be spiritually strong. We're going to be able to uh, keep from falling away. And when it, when it comes to the end, it says this prosperity is going to be that of eternal life. We're going to have the ability to lead to eternal life because we have Christ. Our life will end there if we're willing to walk in him. A thing to, to keep in mind is, you know, there, there's a, a truth to the fact that a tree, if it's planted by good water source, it doesn't burn down very easily. Uh, you know, it has the nourishment it needs. It's not going to burn up. Uh, coming from California, where they don't take care of their forestry very well, and seeing all the forest fires out there, which many of you probably have seen on the news from time to time. Uh, you know, when things are taken care of properly or when things are watered properly or, or whatever needs to be done, you don't necessarily have the same kind of problems. You don't have the same kind of issues. Well, if you're a tree that's firmly planted by the water, you're going to be able to withstand all those issues. You're not going to easily burn down. Well, guess what? What water are you standing by? How close are you to the living water? Are you planted in it? You know, it doesn't just say to walk with Christ here. What does it say? It says walk in him. Are you planted in Christ? Are you planted in the living water? Are you allowing him to maintain you, to keep you safe? Because he will. But you've got to put your life there. The second thing we see in verse 7 is being built up in him. So not, on, not only are we firmly rooted, but we're also being built up in in Christ. We're being built up in the way that we should. Now what we see here, this is the process that we are supposed to be continually working on. This is not 
uh, something that is just one time thing. We don't just build on ourselves once and then we're perfect. We know that's not the case. This is a, uh, a process that we are going to continue throughout our lifetime. We are always going to be uh, working at getting better, working at living in Christ more and more each day. That should be how we strive to live, to walk in Him. Built up has these three meanings to it, um, which is really neat when you look at the words. Uh, it has three aspects. The first is to engage in the building process of personal development. Uh, this is that idea that you're supposed to be uh, part of the process of building yourself up. You have to actually do something about it. Christ can't just build you up in himself. Now, he is a big part of our spiritual life, and he is what we are living in, but he can't force you to build yourself up to make yourself stronger by learning more about him. He's not just going to force information and force strength into your mind. You have to make the choice to do that. You have to be engaging in that process yourself. Another, another aspect is this, uh, of this word is this idea of engaging in edification. You know, this was probably one of the most interesting things that I found when studying this word is the fact that it has to do with edification at all means that guess what? This is an uh, us alone thing. Edification is something that we do for each other. So not only are we supposed to engage in the process of building ourselves up, making ourselves stronger, but we are to engage in helping each other. We are to engage in building each other up, making sure that you stand strong and that you're firmly rooted just the way we are. That way we're all strong together. That way if the trials and the tribulations come or the, or the fires come to try to burn down that tree, we will survive. Because we all are built up on that living water and that living word. And that third is to build up or to build on. This is that idea that you're, you're going you're gonna to build up on that foundation. You're going to continually uh, build it up, not just to engage on yourself, but you're going to continue to build up the, what has been founded on in the first place. Because a really interesting thing is, if you think about this idea, if you take, a, a, let's say, a single-story family home, and you just start adding stories to it every year, do you think it's going to stand forever? How many stories do you think you get before that thing will probably fall over? And, and the idea that I'm getting at here is, is the reason it's talking about building up or building on is not just building on top, but you're also securing the foundation. We need to be working on making sure the foundation continues to be able to hold whatever we put on top of it so that we don't uh, end up getting puffed up in our head, having all this knowledge or whatever you want to call it, and then tumbling over because we think we know better. We need to make sure that we are always firmly founded on Christ and that Christ is everything. It's not about what we want. It's not about what we know. It's about what Christ asks us to do. It's about what he has asked us to do in our lives and how he has asked us to live. We need to continue to build and strengthen those foundations. Not just continually build upon ourselves, but to strengthen the foundation so that the structure itself won't fall. And we need to be doing that for each other as well. You know, sometimes uh, we're going to have things in our lives that maybe we're, we're lacking at. There's going to be things that you're better at that I'm not. And that's an area where you can help me strengthen myself. And I hope in turn I can return that favor for you. I hope there's something I can help you with. And if there is, I hope you ask. But I hope that we can help each other to strengthen each other, to build each other up, but also to firm our foundation on the Word of God, on Christ Himself who is the Word. So that we won't fall, that we won't falter. Again, it's not just about growing in knowledge. It's not uh, just about understanding or knowing what the Bible says. But it's having the foundation not only to know it, but to make it active in your life. To make it a part of your life. To build it into your life. That is what we need to be doing. The third thing we see in verse 7 is this idea of being established in our faith. So what we're talking about here uh, is, is a kind of a really neat word. Um, we all understand a little bit about what faith is, but this word established uh, has a little bit of a different uh, connotation to it. It means this, this firm commitment. So we're not just talking about established in the sense of, you know, I was established since 1990, whatever year you were baptized. We're not talking about established in our faith in that sense, but you have a firm commitment to your faith. 
you have no doubts in your mind. That's what we're talking about. There is nothing going on in your faith that you're going to let doubt take you away. That you're going to let someone like the people who are coming into uh, Colossae and Laodicea and all these places that these people were coming into and trying to create doubt and trying to delude them and trying to do all these things. None of that is going to affect you because your faith is beyond doubt. There is absolutely nothing that can shake you. That is what a firm commitment is talking about. That is what this full assurance comes from. That's what it comes from and it comes with this unyielding faith in Christ. If you truly have faith in Christ, it's going to be awfully hard to shake you. It's going to be awfully hard to tear the roots out from underneath you because you have that full commitment that won't let you doubt. You know, we have this understanding uh, in science that two people can't occupy the same place at the same time. You know, I, I, I could prove it to you right now if somebody wanted to come up and try to stand in the same exact spot as me. It won't work. We're both made of physical matter and we're going to push each other out. We understand the science behind that. But the thing is, is, just because we understand the science and we know it to be true, we need to apply that same thing to our biblical life, to our spiritual life. Sometimes we don't have the same assurance or the same understanding in our minds, or maybe we don't take it to that step. And we don't have this, this uh, commitment or this, this, this full assurity uh, of what is true. But our faith needs to be this way. Our faith needs to be without a doubt. In the same way that two people can't occupy the same space, I have without a doubt that Jesus is my Savior. And I need to walk in Him, and only if I walk in Him can I have full assurance in my spiritual life. I am fully committed to Him in my faith. Saying it's not something that I am blind about, it's not a leap of faith, as many like to call it. But it's something that is based in fact. Something that is based in understanding, in knowledge, and even in science, if you're willing to look at what the Bible actually says. So the question is, can you... Prove or defend your faith. Are you able to defend it beyond the shadow of a doubt if someone were to come up and challenge you? Do you have that ability? If not, are you as established in your faith as you should be? Are you walking Him in the way that you should be? Are you fully committed in the way that you should be? These are some things that I think we all need to think about and remember. Because we all need to, as, as we talked about earlier, this is a, a continually process. It doesn't matter what you think today, we need to continually get better tomorrow. Even if I can defend beyond a shadow of doubt right now, that doesn't mean there isn't still more for me to learn and more for me to grow. Because somebody might someday ask a question that I'm not sure how to answer right now. I need to keep growing in my faith. I need to keep uh, confirming all the things that I know and being able to prove no matter what comes against me. And so I need to walk every day in Him. Not just start the journey. And then stand in one place. It's a continual building on. The last thing that we pull out of verse 7 is this idea of overflowing with gratitude. And every aspect of, of this verse, all four of these points are important on their own. Um, but this one has a lot to it. Again, similar to that word established, the word or the usage of the word overflowing here uh, has some extreme impact on our lives if you're willing to take a look at what it really is talking about here. It means to be outstanding. It means to be prominent. And it means to excel in gratitude. I want you to think, think about those things for a second in your life. When it comes to gratitude for your faith, to walk in, in Him, uh, to have the gratitude towards Christ that you should, is it something that is outstanding to you? Is it something that is prominent in your life? Is it something that you excel at? You know, we were, we've been talking even the last few weeks. We've had it mentioned a few times how blessed we are. And amen, we are blessed to be children of God. We are blessed to have Christ as a Savior. But are we showing that gratitude? Are we overflowing with that gratitude? This idea of, uh, of being prominent in our lives is this gratitude needs to be something that is so abundant in our life. This needs to be something that is so much a part of our life that when you go outside in the world, people see it on your face. That you don't know how to hide it. When you walk up and start talking to somebody, do they know you're a Christian? 
If you do talk to them about Christ, do you look happy about it? Or do you have a face that says, I'm a Christian, but you know, it, eh, it is what it is. Whatever you want to do is fine. What kind of gratitude are you overflowing with? Is it gratitude towards Christ? Is it the kind of gratitude that we should have? This is what we are supposed to be all about. When it comes to being a Christian, this is, this is what it is. We are so blessed to be a part of Christ, to have him in our life. But do you feel that way? If you do, this is the way that you should react. This is the way that your mind and your, and your, your actions should exude. This overflowing gratitude for Christ, for what we receive from him, which is salvation. How excited are you to have Christ in your life? Is it the most exciting thing about your life? I hope so. If it's not, maybe, maybe you don't have the, the gratitude that maybe you should. When you truly understand just what he's done for you, what he's made possible for you, for me, how amazing it is to have Christ. When we talk about him, is it seen? Do people understand just how excited we are about him? How excited we are to be able to walk in him each and every day of our lives? Because what it means to us and the full assurance that we have because of that? You know, it's really hard to get people enthusiastic and want to be a part of something if we aren't enthusiastic ourselves. We need to be seen to have this kind of gratitude when we talk about Christ. Because the truth is, the gratitude that comes uh, from this full assurance of salvation comes when we walk in Him. If we aren't really walking in Him, the likelihood is you aren't going to show this kind of gratitude. You aren't going to have this overflowing gratitude for Christ in the way that you should. But it comes from the salvation that He brings. And not only that, but this gratitude also shows a quality uh, in our own uh, attitudes, in our own perspective in life, in the way that we act, in the way that we treat others, in the way that we go about talking to the world about Christ. Because we are so blessed to have Him, are we not? Amen. We are blessed to have Christ. Where would we be without Him? I wouldn't even know who any of you are. How blessed are we? And the sad thing is, and this is the truth, many don't, and maybe even won't, know this blessing. And the truth is, because many of them refuse to, but there are some out there that want to know. There's going to be some out there that would know, if we are willing to take that information to them. If we are willing to approach them from our own lives and show them what it means to be a son of God. What it means to be saved by Christ, to be blessed by having Him in our life and to show them what it means to walk in Him. Are we going to do that though? Are we going to change the numbers for Christ by taking it to those who otherwise wouldn't have the chance or maybe don't want to know? We need to try anyway. When we walk in Him, this gratitude is shown uh, to be easily seen to the world around us. If you are really walking in Him, it, it's going to be hard for anybody to ignore the fact that you are a Christian. That you understand that you are blessed by Him. And they're going to know exactly what you believe. And you know what? That might have an impact on what they believe. That might even have an impact on the way that they talk to you or the questions that they might ask you. Do people know you're a Christian? Do they see it in the way that you live? The way that you act? The way that you love? Are you walking in Him? You know, it's a wonderful thing that we have Christ. It's a wonderful thing that we get to walk in Him. But guess what? This is a command by Paul. This is a command that we have been given. So the question is, is are you going to carry it out? 
Are you going to live and you're going to walk the way that you should? You know, the really cool thing, and I know I keep saying that about the words here, but this word walk, a lot of people understand that this is the idea of how we are to live our lives. But guess what? There's a, there's a little bit more to it. It's the way that you lead your life. When you choose to walk, how are you going to lead your life? What path are you going to take? What choice are you going to make? Are you going to choose to walk in him? To follow the command that Paul has given us, to follow the thing he has asked us to do? Or are you going to choose to live however you want? Are you going to choose to live whatever way you want to live? Or maybe to allow people to come in and to delude you or to, 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 to change your mind? To, to defraud you of the full assurance that you have in Christ? How are you going to lead yourself? Paul does give us this command, but... He did it so that we wouldn't be taken away from God. He did it so that we wouldn't lose Christ, so that we wouldn't fall away. I have no desire to do so, and I have no desire for any of you to do as well. I want us all to be safe and secure, to have that full assurance in Christ that, that we can have only in Him. Paul is trying to help us find a way to do that, how to have that full assurance. Walk in Him. Be firmly rooted in Christ. Be built up in Christ. Make sure that you're overflowing with gratitude each and every day. Don't ever stop. Make sure that your faith is fully committed, established, so that nothing can tear you away. That there will never be a doubt in your mind. So Paul tells us how to carry out that command. He says, stay close to the living water. For a firm foundation. It tells us to build up and edify each other. So that we are not easily shaken. It's not just something we do alone. We help each other. We firm up each other's foundation. We strengthen each other. We don't tear each other down. We commit to the faith in Christ. And not let doubt into our heart. Not even the slightest bit. And we show Christ our gratitude by making it known to others. Have you made it known to others that you believe in Christ? Do they even know that you attend here? Do they know that you are a son of God? Do they know what you believe? Make it known. Show that you walk in Him. Because if we truly walk in Him, then we can truly have that full assurance in Christ. That is the truth. And I hope that is what you all want. You know, sometimes we've talked about how uh, you know, sometimes it's hard to know if we, our, our desire is to go to heaven, our desire is to be with God for eternity. But sometimes we don't always know if that's the case in our lives. We don't know how to have that full assurance. Here it is. You walk in Him, you have full assurance in Christ that you will be with Him forever. But you have to make that choice. You have to choose what path you want to take. You know, maybe your life looks like this. Maybe you are standing or walking down a road and you've got multiple choices to take. Maybe it's the path of God. Maybe one of them is the path you want to take. Maybe one's the path other people or the world expect you to take. Or I could have put a picture up there that has so many paths you wouldn't be able to count them. Maybe that's what your world feels like. But let me show you the truth. These are the only two paths. You have the right path. That if you're willing to walk, you have full assurance that you will be with God. And every other path that you decide on, unfortunately, leads to a devastating end. What path are you going to lead your life down? What way are you going to choose to walk? I hope that it's choosing the path that is towards God. I hope that you choose to walk in Him. To walk in Christ in the way that Paul has asked you to. In the way that Paul not only asks but commands. But he does it so that we can be safe. He does it so that we will have that full assurance in him. So what are you going to choose this morning? Have you already chosen to follow God? Have you already chosen to have faith in him? To become a child of God? Well, are you still walking that path? Are you living up to what you have been asked to do? Are you walking in him in all the ways that you have been told? If not, maybe now is the time to reinvigorate that walk. To make that choice again. To let us help you along that path. 
Or maybe this morning you never have that chosen that path you want to take. Maybe you're still on that, on that road that looks like you have a lot of different choices. Well, guess what you do? There's a lot of choices you can take. But only one of them leads to the right way. Just like the way we walk, one foot in front of the other. Only one of them is the natural right way that we were designed to walk. Same thing with our spiritual lives. Only one way leads to God, and that is through Christ. Every other path, whether it's your own, or whether it's the world's, or whatever other path you think is out there, unfortunately all will lead to the same destination. And that is a destination that none of us want to go to, and none of us want each other to go to. So I hope this morning you will start your walk, if you haven't already. I hope you will choose to follow the path of righteousness, that you will walk in Him, walk in Christ, and have that full assurance that in the end you will prosper, because you will have God and Christ on your side, and you will find eternal salvation. If you have any need this morning, I hope that you will come and make it known, as together we stand and sing.